Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Dawn Mullally, CPASS's Communication Manager, and we are delighted to have you attend the CPASS Discovery Seminar Series. Uh, CPASS scientists do everything from explore our ocean depths to fly into hurricanes, taking critical measurements, to our heliophysicists modeling coronal mass ejections, and to those who unravel the mysteries of the Arctic. And we want to share this with the public the NCAR, UCAR community, and our many colleagues at universities and agencies across the globe. So just to orient you all, we will be using Slido, which is located below the presentation screen, so that you can pose questions to our speaker at any time during the seminar, and they will be answered after the presentation. So today, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Dr. Ryan Harp. He is a current NOAA CDC climate and health postdoctoral researcher with UCAR CPAS, a climate scientist by training. His research focuses on an intersection of climate and human health, namely vector borne disease, with an emphasis on applicable results. In his projects, Ryan combines weather and climate observations and global climate model output with various health and societal data sets to advance our knowledge of interactions between human and earth systems. Ryan is also involved with the greater climate and health community, recently serving as a co-chair of the AGU Geo Health Early Career Committee, and as a member of CPAS's own U.S. Clivar Working Group on Climate and Health. Today, Dr. Ryan Harp shares with us, uh, he is joining us today to share his recent work, Building Toward a Climate-Informed West Nile Virus Forecast. Ryan? Thank you, Donna, for that introduction. And thank you to all the organizers for uh, the invitation to, to be here today and to present on my research. It's great to be with you all. So as was just mentioned, I'm Ryan Harp, and I am the current NOAA CDC climate and health postdoctoral researcher. I'll be talking about um, yeah, a couple of projects that I'm working on within my, my postdoc research, building toward a climate-informed West Nile virus forecast. So first, just a little bit of background about me, because you might be wondering how you find yourself in an interesting interdisciplinary position like I am currently in. So I grew up in the, the great state of Wisconsin, and for undergrad, I attended University of Wisconsin-Madison and majored in atmospheric and oceanic sciences and psychology. So I am, you know, by training, a atmospheric and climate scientist. I continue that in my PhD work just down the road at CU Boulder in the atmospheric and oceanic sciences department. And my dissertation work, though, is a little bit uh, unorthodox. So it was focusing on links between climate and human health and specifically looking at how climate affects crime and then also how uh, climate variability can affect malaria in Mozambique. So I did a brief virtual pit stop and I did a postdoc at Northwestern University in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department, a little bit more traditional climate work doing precipitation climatologies before coming back here about a year and a half ago to, um, to join the UCAR CPAS community and specifically uh, also be affiliated with NOAA and CDC working on these vector-borne disease problems. So with that, I just want to, first of all, thank all of my wonderful collaborators. So I have a great team behind me uh, located all around the U.S. So on the left here, these are, um, this is Stan, Ben, and Dave from the Global Systems Laboratory just down the road at the, the NOAA office in Boulder. I also work with Julie Dutton and Hunter Jones out of the Climate Program Office in Silver Spring. And uh, most, perhaps most importantly for, for me, at least in terms of, of gaining expertise, I'm able to work with a great team at CDC as well. So there's a Division of Vector-Borne Diseases branch of the CDC, which is uh, headquartered up in Fort Collins. So that is also just, just down the road and work with a, a great, great team of collaborators there. So with that, we'll dive in. So West Nile virus is the most impactful mosquito-borne disease in the continental U.S. So it's primarily carried by Culex mosquitoes. It also goes through a stage in its life cycle within birds, typically songbirds, so birds like robins, finches, uh, sparrows, things of that nature. And 
humans are considered dead end hosts. So we can contract West Nile virus and we can fall sick from it, but we can't transmit it back into the regular uh, transmission cycle. But the people who do contract West Nile virus, about eight in 10 people don't experience any symptoms whatsoever. They'll have no idea that they were sick. About two in 10 people do have symptoms, typically just a fever, flu-like symptoms. They likely don't get checked out. They just feel crummy for a couple of days and that's about it. They go on with their lives. But fortunately, about one in 150 people do experience a severe neuroinvasive form of this disease or WNND, as you'll see it abbreviated for the rest of this talk. And due to the severity of these particular cases, they are the most likely to be properly diagnosed and reported into some of the data sets that we use. And so for our West Nile virus forecasting efforts and a lot of the analysis that goes into it, we really just focus on these neuroinvasive disease, disease counts, but keep in mind that these are just you know, just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the overall number of cases. So what's now virus is highly variable both temporally and spatially. So here we're looking at the number of cases per year going back to 1999 when um, West Nile was first introduced into the U.S. in New York City. Over the next five years or so it spread to all the way to the west coast. So you'll see you know, the initial epidemic here. But since then, it's varied quite a bit. So the 10-year median number of cases is about 1,300, but you'll see that drops anywhere from, or can go anywhere from below 500 to nearly 3,000 cases in a given year. So there's a lot of variability year to year. There's also a lot of variability spatially as well. So this is looking at the number of cases occurring in each county in the U.S. per 100,000 people. You can see this hot spot starting in the Dakotas, working its way down the Great Plains into the, the panhandle of Texas here. And there's also hot spots along the, the Gulf and the Southwest as well in California and Arizona. And of course, if you don't look at per capita and you're looking at just the number, sheer number of cases, there's other places that pop out as well. So New York City, of course, and Chicago areas with a larger population do experience a, a large number of cases as well. So note, West Nile virus and its vectors are complexly influenced by climatic factors. And I say complexly here because the change in one particular variable can have multiple competing effects. So for instance, higher temperature on one hand can both speed up the development of Culex mosquitoes and also past a certain point can lead to increased mortality of those same mosquitoes. So you end up with what you see on the right here. So this is a image from Shockett et al. looking at the, essentially the transmission of West Nile virus for four different Culex mosquitoes around um, that are you know, prim the primary carriers around the US. You can see on, on the left side of, of this plot here is where you can see the speeding up of the development as temperature rises and we hit this peak here and then once we hit go past the peak with rising temperature. Now these mosquitoes are starting to experience that increased mortality and, and dying off more quickly. And so there's these competing factors here all due to just a change in temperature. Something similar happens for precipitation. So on one hand, a increased amount of rainfall can lead to additional breeding habitats. But if that rainfall is too intense, it can also wash out existing breeding habitats, uh, particularly places like man-made containers and, and things of that nature. So there's just this um, complicated interaction between the climate and West Nile virus. There are a few other climate factors that are also linked to the disease. Drought, soil moisture, relative humidity, vapor pressure deficit, and just the incoming solar radiation. And now, a lot of these are, are not independent, but they've all been cited within the literature in, in one study or another. And so we can add in our, our little sun and clouds here to our West Nile virus cycle. And so that brings us to the NOAA and CDC partnership. And so really there are two goals coming out of, out of this partnership. So the first is to just increase our knowledge of how these various climatic factors affect West Nile virus. The second is to incorporate 
weather and climate forecasts into our disease forecasts of West Nile virus to increase our forecast lead time. So right now, forecasts, if they do incorporate weather or climate data, um, these forecasts of West Nile virus are typically just looking at uh, observed weather and climate data. And we think we can increase our lead time of these forecasts by adding in weather and climate forecasts. And this also dovetails with a, a document that just came out by the CDC a couple of months ago, which is the National Public Health Strategy for the Prevention and Control of Vector-Borne Diseases in Humans. And one of the specific goals of this strategy, which was also produced alongside a number of other federal agencies, including NOAA, but one of the goals is to reduce the annual number of West Nile virus neuroinvasive disease cases to below 500 over the course of the next 10 to 12 years or so. And so this is uh, a, a great target for us to, to aim for and is quite a bit below our 1,300, um, you know, kind of where we're, we're at right now, about 1,300 cases per year. And so with all that in mind, this brings me to the, the two projects that I have been working on over the last year and a half or so. So the first is facilitating and analyzing CDC-hosted West Nile virus forecasting challenges, which we'll dive into in just a moment. And the second is characterizing these relationships between climate and West Nile virus, and ultimately see if we can build out a climate-informed West Nile virus forecast. So you might be wondering what is a West Nile virus forecasting challenge or just what is a disease forecasting challenge in general? And so disease modeling teams are invited from, um, from anywhere they would like uh, to submit forecasts for West Nile virus for the upcoming transmission season. And these forecasts are submitted probabilistically at either the annual county level or the monthly state level, depending on the year of the challenge. And just to give an idea of what these forecasts look like, this is looking at a county in Arizona, and each of the dots here represents the probability that we will see the number of cases listed on, on the x-axis here. And so you can see for this particular county, there is a high probability of having zero, one, two cases. And this vertical line here is showing that the observed number of cases for that county, and this is a pretty good forecast because the number of cases that occurred was in one of the higher likelihood um, bins, if you will. This is a less great forecast for just down the road, Weld County. And you can see here, there's a fairly low probability of the observed 22 cases for this particular challenge. And so this is a, a forecast that did not do as great of a job of picking up on that year's outbreak. And that gives an idea of just what these forecasts look like when they're submitted by the modeling teams. So once we have these forecasts, and of course, once the season is over and we have the, the total number of cases, then we analyze our forecasts to see are there consistent methodologies that are used for the models that did particularly well. So is there something that they did in common? Are there particular um, inputs that they used, for instance, of course, climate data like we've been talking about or mosquito surveillance data that is helping to contribute to their better accuracy. And as I mentioned earlier, teams from everywhere can participate. So we primarily have academic teams, but there are also some local public health agencies and even some private sector teams that participate as well. And for the uh, climate folks in the room, you might make the analogy here between forecasting challenges and some of the model intercomparison projects, you know, CMIP logo shown here, where we are essentially collecting these forecast projections from a variety of different sources and then comparing and contrasting them to see what we can learn from these different methodologies. So some high level goals of the forecasting challenge. First of all, just to examine the current state of our West Nile virus forecast forecasting capabilities. So you know, as a community, can we accurately predict the upcoming year's West Nile virus season? And then as I mentioned before, we can compare submitted models. 
We also aim to facilitate communication and collaboration between modeling teams. So we host uh, recurring meetings. Ultimately, we'd like to provide useful forecasts to help public health and mosquito control agencies combat West Nile virus. And we're also trying to build toward more open science and data sharing. But for the rest of this talk, or at least the first portion, I'll just be focusing on, on those first two. It's just how are we doing forecasting West Nile virus? And are there things that we can learn about models that have been submitted? So to set the stage for the 2022 results, the version of the challenge before that was in 2020, so we skipped 2021. But the 2020 challenge, the analysis was done and written up by uh, Karen Holcomb, who is the person in my role before me, my predecessor. And some of the results or some of the conclusions from the, the last challenge were that you know, the best prediction of future cases is really just what has happened in the past. And so it's essentially you know, the climatology is the best prediction that we have for future cases, which of course is not particularly satisfying because that means that other models that are you know, adding in other, other factors, they're doing different regression techniques, all sorts of stuff, might be employing machine learning. They ultimately are not really achieving any meaningful increase in skill and are, are generally performing worse than just that historical baseline. And the prediction of outbreaks remains difficult. So diving into the 2022 season, first of all, just the number of cases that happened in 2022 is relatively low. So there are about 831 cases nationwide, which is again, well below that 10 year historical median of about 1300. Here's where they occurred. So you can see you know, a lot of the, the typical hotspots here are places that saw cases in 2022. So uh, the Dakotas, Colorado here at home were certainly within the, the, the hotspot of West Nile virus. Southwest, places like New York. But only 23 or 237 counties exceeded their 10 year median. So, as you'd expect, there weren't a ton of cases uh, nationwide, and so most counties did not hit their 10 year medians. And only 13 counties recorded their first observed case in 2022. And of note, there's about a thousand counties or so that have to date not recorded a a neuroinvasive disease within their boundaries. And so 13 counties um, unfortunately did in 2022. And so, you know, we have these forecasts. I just walked through what actually happened in 2022, but how do we go ahead and score these probabilistic forecasts? So there are some different metrics that are used within the disease forecasting community. And earlier forecasting challenges, including the, the 2020 version, often used logarithmic scoring. And um, I put the math on the, on the right here, but I'm not going to walk through it at all. But I'm just going to compare the, the logarithmic scoring with what we're shifting toward for the 2022 analysis, which is use, using weighted interval scoring, or WIS, as you'll see abbreviated. And the reason we do so is because the, the weighted interval scoring allows for a more granular breakdown of our scoring into different components. So a dispersion component and then an over or under prediction component. So this is combining not only, or attempting to look at is the forecast accurate, but also how descriptive is it? So, you know, for example, I could give you a 100% likelihood of succeeding forecast. I would say the temperature tomorrow in Boulder is gonna be between zero and 150 degrees. Feel pretty confident that that is going to happen, but that doesn't really tell us anything about the actual state of what's going to happen. It's just too broad of a forecast. And so we can start to look at things like that when we shift over to this weighted interval scoring. And this paper down on the bottom right here by Brocker et al, evaluating epidemic forecasts in an interval format is a great reference if you are interested in um, further discussion of these scoring metrics. So the main takeaway is that the ensemble was the best performing forecast. So this is a great finding because the ensemble is essentially just a combination of all of the submitted forecasts. And so the fact that the ensemble, which is number one here, was able to beat our historical baseline, which is what you see in number two here, is great because it's showing that there's some level of skill gained by our modeling teams. And we combine them all into an ensemble product, then you know, we're smoothing out maybe some of the 
the rough edges of individual submissions and we're able to get a little bit of extra skill. And I should note that the closer to zero a score is, the better that forecast was. And so we have sorted them here. But you know, beyond just kind of this you know, one, two, three, four, five ranking, a better way to look at it is to you know, determine are these models statistically different in terms of their results. And we, we do so, we look at kind of a matrix on the right here. We've done some bootstrapping comparisons to allow us to compare different models. And everywhere there's purple here means that the ensemble, for instance, is statistically different than that historical caseload, which is what you see on the bottom here. And anywhere that we have these lighter blue lines are areas where the models are for all purposes, essentially the same in terms of their ability to forecast. So you know, these four models here, of course, they all have the, the same score shown here, but um, well, even going down into this, this fifth one here, they're all statistically the same in terms of their performance. And so we can break these out into different tiers, which I think is a little bit of a better way to think about their performance, conceptually speaking. And then we can go ahead and, and color code them like this, just to make it a little bit easier to see. But so when we move beyond just looking at all of the counties, and instead we focus on just high caseload counties. So these are the counties there's roughly about 50 or so counties that give us the total of about 50% of the overall caseload around the US in a given year. And when we focus in on just those higher impactful um, or high impact counties and look at how teams performed on just that subset of counties, we see you know, results that are mostly the same, but we do start to see some shifting around. And so specifically we see this, the ensemble forecast is now joined into that top tier. It's no longer standing out on its own. Um, but also notably, we do see some pretty dramatic shifts from some models, like for instance, this Kansas Bayesian model, which uh, was bringing up the rear when we look at all counties has now jumped into the top tier. And in fact is statistically um, indistinguishable from the ensemble model and any of the other models within that, that top tier there. And we also see a model like, for instance, our naive historical model, which is essentially a, a very uh, basic baseline, which uh, frankly, we hope that um, you know, all of our models are able to beat. And that falls down to the bottom for these high caseload counties. And so that is you know, a, a good thing to see. So I mentioned earlier that we can compare and contrast how models incorporated in different characteristics, so be it uh, how their methodology produced the forecast, as well as the data that they were including within it. And so what you see here, this is just showing the model characteristics that each team, shown on the left here, incorporated into their particular forecast. So these are a number of different characteristics, and we don't need to, to get into all of them here, but just you can see this checkerboard effect. And this is a you know, indicator that we can uh, compare and contrast how these models were um, how they incorporated these different factors and how their performance ended up doing with these different characteristics in mind. And so some of the model factors that are associated with forecast performance. So when we look at all of the counties, models that used a Bayesian component or regression-based component tended to perform better than those that did not. And conversely, those that included climate data or demographic data or avian data tended to do worse. Now it shifts around a little bit when we, you know, again, start looking at these higher impact counties. Now we're seeing that mosquito surveillance data and avian data might be important, which is interesting to note that our avian data has completely flipped between being um, between hurting our forecasts and helping our forecasts. But we're still seeing climate data and demographic data now, any mosquito data included. Um, harming our overall forecasts. And just two more subsets that we looked at. First of all, counties with historical cases. So this is roughly 2,000 or so counties. We're seeing that regression forecasts and mosquito surveillance data, again, great, seems to help out with our, our forecast accuracy, but climate data, demographic data, and avian data all does not. And when we look at counties that have not seen a case in the past, again, this is about 1,000 counties or so, we see ensemble forecasts, ensemble-based forecasts tend to do better, 
but there's this whole list here of different variables that when they're included seem to lead to worse performance. And what we think is happening here is that you know, historical case or places that have not seen a case historically, they are very likely to continue not seeing cases. So as I mentioned, there are only about 1% of counties that had not seen a case prior to 2022 that all of a sudden saw a case. And so if we are you know, using all this additional data and trying to predict which particular counties might see cases or have a higher likelihood of seeing cases, that might just be you know, kind of overkill for these particular forecasts. And you're probably you're better off just saying, you know, none of these counties will see a fork, uh, or will see a a case of neuroinvasive disease in, in the upcoming year, or maybe they have, just have a really low likelihood of doing so. Well, this did bring us to some potentially conflicting results between 2020 and 2022. So our 2020 challenge just focuses on on all counties, so we didn't have those subsets, but we did see that in 2020, our climate data and demographic data seem to help model performance, whereas in our most recent iteration, it is hurting our forecast performance. So this is something that we are exploring and you know, it's one of the, the interesting findings that we're able to come up with by having kind of a repeated sequence of these forecast challenges. So we also looked at the contextual factors on forecast accuracy. So this is looking at, you know, are there particular aspects of counties that are leading to better or worse forecast performance across all of the, the different forecasts. And so, for instance, for minimum temperature, like we, you, which we're looking at on the left right here, places that had kind of a moderate winter temperature of you know, roughly negative 20 Celsius or so had better forecast accuracy than those that had you know, either brutally cold or very mild winters. And so, you know, are there, you know, why might this be? Are there reasons why places that experience a more moderate winter temperature have a, um, a better forecast accuracy in general than those that did not. And you see something similar for total population on the right here. So different pattern, but places that either had very little or a lot of population within a given county tended to have better forecasts than those that had you know, a more moderate number of people. So this is still something that, that's going on right now. So we don't have final answers here yet, but something we are exploring. And I mentioned earlier that we're looking at, or that there are two different metrics, the weighted interval scoring that we focused on and then log scoring, which we've used in the past. So this is uh, looking at surprisal or essentially the, the negative log score because they're just inverted in terms of their um, a negative Log scores tend to be negative, weighted interval scores are positive, and so we're just flipping our log scores to match up with our weighted interval scores. But you can see here that they're, they're highly correlated, which is great, but also not completely correlated, which is good because now we have things to compare and contrast between our different metrics. And um, you might have noticed this little kind of spot right here, and it's just a statistical artifact, but we do see some marginally different results when we look at weighted interval scoring versus log scoring. So here we're looking at our different tiers. On the left is our weighted interval score, which you saw before. On the right is using our log scoring. And our tiers stay predominantly the same, but there's some shifting around of the, the order. For instance, you can see this USC INLA um, is now the, the top model when we look at our, our log scoring. Um, but again, these are all you know, within the same tier and, and indistinguishable for um, statistical purposes. So the takeaway messages for our analysis of the 2022 forecasting challenge, the ensemble forecast was the best performing model, which is again, great because it's showing that there's some level of skill that we're gaining by um, including all of these different models together. And it's great to see that we can beat this historical forecast as that's a, a, a bar that we hope we would be able to clear. Bayesian and regression-based forecasts performed well. And forecasts using additional covariates tended to do worse, just you know, broadly speaking there. Um, and there were some differences between what we found in the 2020 findings. The investigation into contextual factors is ongoing and some subtle but significant discrepancies exist in our results depending on either the subset of counties that we're using, um, but also 
whether or not we are using our weighted interval scoring or, or log scoring. So to just kind of summarize up where the state of West Nile virus forecasting is, there's a lot left to learn. Our community forecasts are not providing additional accuracy beyond just historical distributions, but there are some hints of increasing community capabilities, as I just mentioned with that ensemble. So with that, we're going to shift over to uh, the second focus of my talk, which is characterizing relationships between climate and West Nile virus. So to do so, we're combining disease and climate data together. So we have county monthly counts of West Nile neuroinvasive disease from 1999 through 2022 from CDC Arbonet, which is a national surveillance system that is hosted out of the Division of Vector-Borne Disease in Fort Collins. We're combining that with climate data and specifically gridded, observed, or gridded observation products like PRISM and GridMet. And you can see the, the list of variables that we're looking at here, but both of those data sets are statistically downscaled gridded data sets at about four kilometers of resolution, spanning from about 1980 to the present. And so one thing that we have noticed, or one thing that um, we're speculating that is causing our forecast skill to be so low is that, like I mentioned, most counties don't experience a case of neuroinvasive disease in a given year. And so with that, it's very hard to pick up on any sort of statistical signal that might be meaningful and when you're trying to combine it with, for instance, climate data. And so here on the left here, this is show, just a histogram showing on the x-axis, this is the logged number of cases and then just a count of the number of county years that experience that number of cases. So you can see of the 3,000 or so counties that we're looking at, uh, the vast majority do not see a case in a given year, about 90% and did not see a, a case in 2022. Only about 6% average one or more cases per year since West Nile became endemic in 2005. So to combat that, we're upscaling our data onto a hexagonal grid. So we're going from these 3,000 counties onto about 112 hexes, and our hexes are about two degrees latitude and longitude in size, and you'll see a map of what they look like in just a minute. But when we aggregate our data onto these, these hexes. Now we see only 37% didn't see a case in 2022, and nearly three quarters average one or more cases per year. And so you can see that the difference between these two histograms and the thought is that this increased location-specific caseload is boosting the variability, and we can start to use that variability to uh, for our statistical analysis and try and pull out any signal that there might be within these cases through the noise. So I'm just going to walk through a couple of examples of what this looks like. So specifically here, we're looking at the impact of June temperature on annual caseload for, uh, this is just 19 hexes right here. So about these 19 hexes comprise about 50% of our overall cases. So again, just focusing on higher impact areas here. And places in red, like the Midwest into the Northeast, you can see places where higher June temperatures lead to increased cases of, of West Nile virus. And the inverse is true in the, the Gulf states here into Oklahoma and, and Texas. And you know, we're seeing some kind of regional clustering happening here. Maybe we're looking at two sides of, of that um, plot that I showed earlier. So in places where it's not quite as warm, typically in June, you know, warmer temperatures lead to more cases, but places where it's a bit hotter in general, we might be getting past that peak and seeing increased mortality of our mosquitoes. But we do see this kind of regional clustering here. And here's another example when we look at the impact of March drought on our annual caseload. So anywhere in blue here, like you see this really strong cluster where the central part of the U.S. are places where more drought leads to a greater number of cases. And the fact that we still are seeing you know, some spatial clustering here is showing that you know, maybe even some additional aggregation beyond the hex level might be beneficial. So we went from counties to our hexes, 112 hexes, and we're going to shift on to using 
neon regions or what you what you see here. So there are Nas the National Ecological Observatory Network or NEON put together a essentially created 20 ecoclimatic regions. So these are regions that were defined in, in large part due to the, the climate of the region, but done so in a way to be ecologically meaningful. So are there particular aspects of temperature, precipitation, et cetera, that are important for life in that area? So for instance, you know, the number of days below or above freezing, for instance. And so there are 20 of these domains, regions within the U.S., and about 17 within the continental U.S. And some early analysis when we aggregate up to the NEON level is, is promising. So here we're looking at you know, this cluster again of, of June temperature and its impact on West Nile for, for the Gulf here. And you can see the, the correlations shown here for each of those hexes, which is an average of about 0.3 or so. But then when we aggregate up onto this neon level where um, we're essentially combining a lot of the, the data that went into each of those hexes, now we see correlations that are a fair amount higher. And so we're hopeful that the relationships that we're seeing here are more reflective of what is truly going on underneath the surface and the true relationships between climate and West Nile virus. And just to, to drive home this point, earlier we looked at drought as well, and here we're still seeing this really strong signal of drought through the, the central part of the country where higher levels of drought leads to increased um, caseload. And you know, beyond just looking at some, some cherry-picked examples, one thing that we're looking at right now, and I'll walk through this, this image on the right here because it's, it's quite a bit, but we're looking at correlation heat maps and seeing what they can tell us about the importance of particular climate variables. So on the x-axis here, this is showing six different of the climate variables that are of interest to us. And on, on the y-axis here, this is just months, as you can see. So essentially we're looking at, you know, for instance, March drought in the Northern Plains. So this is the Dakotas into Montana, perhaps Nebraska. And you know the correlation between those two is is pretty high, and so when we look at kind of all of these together, we can see that, for instance, well, as I just pointed out, spring drought tends to be a really dominant factor of West Nile virus, but also you know May temperatures can be a key factor as well. So there are a couple of really strong relationships coming out of here. You might note that there's you know, some missing blocks here, and this is because we just applied a very very loose statistical significance threshold to our, our results before throwing them on here. So with this, we can look at other regions as well. So here we're looking at the Pacific Southwest. And here we see that you know, late winter, early spring temperatures tend to be critical for the number of cases that are happening in that part of the country. But not all of our regions have these clear relationships or see you know, as much of an impact of our weather and climate onto the annual caseload. So for instance, here we're looking at the mid-Atlantic and we do see you know, a couple of fairly strong correlations popping out, but this, this matrix looks a lot more sparse than the ones we were looking at before. And here in the, the Southeast, we're seeing you know, even the correlations that are here, there's a few more than in the mid-Atlantic, but by and large, they're not quite as strong. And so these areas are just, the, the number of cases of West Nile tends to be less influenced by the climate in that area. So now that we have an idea of what the most important climate drivers of disease are within each of these regions, we can work to apply them into a disease forecast of our own and then compare it against that historical uh, distribution, like I mentioned before. And so our, our path forward here is, you know, like I mentioned, we've been identifying the important climate factors. We're gonna take, perform a, a regression using a, um, a negative binomial distribution, which is essentially, that is what our historical data looks like. It takes the form of a negative binomial distribution. And then we're going to perform a leave one out analysis to test 
the accuracy of a hindcast at that neon level. So we're going to see, can we accurately forecast the number of cases that have happened in the past if we leave out that, that given year? And, and hopefully compare that favorably to our historical distributions. And then once we've done some proof of concept there, uh, we're going to see if we're going to be able to downscale our forecasts from these you know, fairly aggregated neon regions that have several states in them onto a more local scale. So is there a, can we accurately translate those relationships down onto the county level that's going to be a bit more relevant for disease or relevant for decision-making and public health actions, things of that nature? Just Is there a way to get from these really high aggregated scales onto a more local actionable scale? And then finally, we'll see if there if we can successfully incorporate in our weather forecasts as inputs into our disease forecasts. And just a couple other quick hitters that we've been looking at uh, that I wanna share with you all before we wrap up here. So we've been looking at the seasonality and the timing of West Nile virus as well. And so seasonality is essentially how condensed the number of cases are or, well, for us, we're looking at the number of cases, but actually the definition of seasonality that I've been using was developed for precipitation by Walsh and Lawler. And it's essentially um, a very limited, or a precipitation that is not very seasonal would have the same amount of precipitation in every single month. Something that's very seasonal would peak very sharply in a particular season. And so for our West Nile, season, it tends to peak very strongly in August and September, a few cases on the months on either side, but there's a really sharp peak associated with the season. And so that's what you're seeing here. Places that are, are more purple, which is, tends to be the further north you go, they are more seasonal. And so there might be climate limitations that are um, forcing, essentially cutting off kind of the extended part of the season beyond August and September that are leading to this sharper seasonal cycle. And the inverse is true for places like the desert Southwest where, you know, for instance, it's, it's much warmer year round than it is in um, the Northern States. So in addition to looking at seasonality, we also looked at the timing of each West Nile virus season. And so essentially we took the average time that a case occurred within each of our hexes and we saw how much did those did that timing vary. And what we notice is that the, the timing of the season is most variable over this portion of Arizona right here, which is where Maricopa County is, which is, for instance, where Phoenix is. And this gives us a possible forecast of opportunity because we see that this timing is really variable. And it's also strongly linked to July and August precipitation which is driven by the North American monsoon, which has been shown to have some predictability up to three to four months into the future. And so, you know, of course, there's a few steps here, but this is one possible forecast of opportunity, and we're hoping to identify others where we might be able to boost our forecast lead time by incorporating these you know, sub-seasonal to seasonal climate uh, weather forecasts. So just to wrap up here, some lessons learned and next steps toward our climate-informed West Nile virus forecast. So the regional aggregation boosts our statistical signal and our relationship strength. We're currently testing our climate-informed disease models and comparing and contrasting against that historical distribution to see can we just beat this, this baseline, which to this point has proven difficult to do. There are some potential forecasts of opportunity that we've identified and we're hoping to identify more. And then long-term, can we use our weather forecasts as input um, into climate-informed disease models? And like I mentioned before, we're really just using observations at this point. Nobody's using forecasts at all. So do we have enough, first of all, forecast skill on the, the weather side to incorporate uh, these forecasts from short-term all the way to seasonal? And um, do they are they accurate enough for us to be able to um, you know, properly boost our disease lead time, disease forecast lead time. 
So with that, I will say thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions now, or if you'd like to reach out to me directly, feel free to respond to my NOAA um, email right there. Thanks again. Well, thank you very much for sharing your work, Ryan. Uh, we truly appreciate it. And it's obvious that it's this is the kind of work that's just going to become more and more important. Um, so now, like Ryan mentioned, we are on to the Q&A portion of today's seminar. I'd like to direct everyone's attention to the QR code on your screen. Um, please enter your questions here for our speaker. And while you are doing that, I would like to invite you to attend our next seminar on Wednesday, May 15th at 11 a.m. Mountain Time, uh, where we will have Morali Malasala, uh, CPAS Associate Scientist with the National Centers for Environmental Prediction, uh, present on the hybrid post-processing of GEFS version 12 reforecast for summer maximum temperature ensemble forecast with an extended time scale over Taiwan. Say that twice fast. Um, <laughs> please join us for that talk as well. And we would also invite you to find this talk and other past uh, CPAS uh, discovery seminars on our YouTube channel. Um, let's see. Do we have any questions? If we don't, I have one. <laughs> okay. Um, so I can see that you guys are still working on these models and I can see how this is super, super important as our climate continues to change and there's gonna be more and more health issues connected to climate change. Can this sort of model, is it agnostic enough that you could apply it to other vector-borne diseases like malaria or Zika or is it so specific that it's like, this is West Nile land and that's it? Yeah, that's a good question. I think there's definitely lessons that we can learn from this work that could be applied to other vector-borne diseases. I think I mentioned some of the limitations that we're dealing with and specifically looking at like trying to combat the relatively low number of cases of West Nile that are happening in a given year and trying to, that's something that we've been trying to push through over the course of, of this work. And that is, uh, at least from a disease modeling side, a, an advantage to um, working on something like malaria where there tend to be a lot more cases. And so at least when you're trying to, to model those vector-borne diseases that are a bit more common, it's a little bit easier. You can kind of bypass a lot of the, the work that I've been doing, trying to aggregate up to, to a level and then maybe try and downscale back to a more local level that's a bit more actionable. You should hopefully be able to just work at the, the scales that you are hoping to have answers for directly. And so you might not have to um, deal with you know, some of the, the extra stuff that is, is going on. But I do think that a lot of the lessons that we've learned here are certainly applicable. And we hope that, that we'll be able to inform other forecasts. Excellent, thank you. Um, the questions aren't projecting, but I have access to them here. Um, we have another question from uh, Dennis. Do you have any thoughts on the virus ever being eliminated? That's a good question. That's, yeah, it's something that we are, I know that there, I'd say at this point, the answer is probably not, at least in the short term. I know that there are efforts to develop a vaccine for West Nile virus that's going through some, some testing, um, but the, I know there's issues with, with testing, even just because of the, the relatively low number of cases. And so it makes it hard to kind of compare and contrast different groups. And so say in the short term, uh, probably not, but that's probably a good question for others who are a bit higher up in the, the West Nile research community. Okay, we have another question from David. It says, malaria has been documented moving into higher altitudes as the climate has warmed. Has there been any similar change looked at or observed with West Nile virus? Another good question. I am not sure if West Nile has been looked at quite at that specific of a level. Um, I, yeah, I've definitely heard what was mentioned about the change in the, the malaria range. I do know that there's a couple of papers out there looking at essentially the range of these Culex mosquitoes that carry West Nile 
in, in the U.S. and seeing, you know, is that range projected to change going forward? You know, is there, um, are there temperature limits or precipitation limits that are going to be shifting as we move into a, a climate, into different climate states? And so I know that that, that work's being done. I, yeah, I'm not sure about you know, very specifically West Nile virus, because of course that's a, a little bit different question than just where are the mosquitoes going to be and where is, uh, where is you know, appropriate habitat for mosquitoes. So that's, I think at this point, that's, it's what I've seen out there is more focused on, on just the vectors itself, but not quite getting to the, the level of disease. Okay, we have another question from Jasmine. Um, do places in the U.S. that don't have cases of West Nile not have mosquitoes or not have mosquitoes with the West Nile virus? I think that places that haven't observed cases, and there's a few different reasons why that might be. So it could be. Uh, what Jasmine is, is mentioning here, you know, that there are there are certain areas, of course, where we are not seeing, um, that might not have habitats suitable for mosquitoes, thinking of you know, more mountainous communities, um, things of that nature. But I think a lot of this is not that they haven't been, that they don't have West Nile, but likely that the cases aren't being properly diagnosed or that the cases that, that are occurring are you know, part of the 80%, for instance, that don't have any symptoms whatsoever, um, or you know, even that 20% of people who, who get a case and likely don't get checked out, they have no idea that they have it. And so I think that those are um, likely, a, you know, what's explaining more of the gaps than, than maybe some more you know, mosquito or, or virus driven um, explanations. I think it's a lot of it's just doing an underdiagnosis of areas that have low population just due to those lack of severity for most cases. Understood. Um, Janice asks, how confident are you that differences between predictions and recorded cases are due to inadequacies in the model and uh, as you know, primarily serious illness cases are reported at about 80% are not noticed. I had neuroinvasive West Nile virus five times, not, did not seek treatment and was not counted. Yeah, that's a very interesting issue for the this particular virus. Yeah, and so getting to the, the question there of the differences between predictions and, and recorded cases due to inadequacies of the model. I think that that is in large part true, but I think in large part that is because of the fact that the data that we're using to train our model is fairly limited. And so, you know, we can only train on the, the you know, accurate data that we have. And so if we had a, a higher number of cases, you know, if we try to um, you know, model over something where we had, you know, hundred percent of cases documented into a database. I think we'd have a better likelihood of, of properly modeling West Nile for, for the U S but I think right now it's just a lot of the struggles of our forecasts are, are really due to the, the data limitations that we have. And at this point they seem fairly hard to bypass, but it's, it's a good question. Okay, it looks like Teresa has our next one. Is there a communication mechanism in place for you to inform public health departments of your forecasts? This is, I'm assuming, when the scale increases. Yeah, so at this point, we do communicate the forecast that we have for the forecast challenges. So those are communicated with interested public health agencies through some ongoing partnerships that the CDC has with different institutions. Um, of course, like I've mentioned, these are fairly heavily caveated. And as far as I know, there's not really action being taken in terms of you know, these national level forecasts and, and influencing more local level decision making. There are a small number of locally produced and locally focused forecasts that have a little bit, um, they have been you know, shown to have some effectiveness. 
I believe there's one in South Dakota, for instance, where they might have a little bit better access to, to data and where West Nile is a bit more of a, of a common threat. So they maybe have additional data that they can include, like um, the number of mosquitoes in the area that, that have West Nile virus um, that are being more consistently trapped than they are for other communities that aren't as concerned about it. And so at the, the local scale, there are some forecasts outside of what we're doing that are potentially being used, but it's, it's a small number and the, the forecasts that we have are being disseminated, but I don't think that they are being used at this point in time, just due to the lack of, of skill um, more than anything else. Thank you. Uh, and then we have a question from Forrest. Do you have an idea of what climate and weather model improvements would be most beneficial to improving the West Nile virus forecast? For example, model resolution, temperature accuracy, precipitation accuracy. Yeah, that's a good question. And I'll you know, take a step back from the West Nile forecasting itself, just because I think that you know, a lot of the problems that we have there are, are less um, driven by issues with our weather and climate forecasts and more driven by just the data limitations that we have or some of the disease modeling uh, issues that, that we have. But I would say in general, something that I am frequently asked about by the public health and epidemiologists, folks who I work with is, you know, how, how fine of a resolution can we get? You know, can we get data down to like sub-kilometer um, forecasts and things of that nature, which of course is certainly not something that, that we have for our, our climate models and um, even for our, our weather forecasts, you know, at, at best we, you know, have, um, I think our best shortest range forecasts are on the level that, that we get requests for from the public health community, but still not at the level that, that they wish. And of course there's you know, limitations to the, the really high resolution forecast as well. Um, just thinking in terms of their, how, how far into the future that they're going, you know, thinking of like the high resolution, high resolution rapid refresh um, and, and other models similar to that. So I think you know, the higher resolution, the, the better is the, the thought from the public health community. And of course, you know, is that something that the climate and weather modeling community can provide. And that's certainly an open question. And I think something that, of course, a lot of people are working on actively, but that I would say is the primary thing that I get asked about from public health collaborators. It looks like we just got a new question that came in. Um, how do you handle the fact, this is from, uh, Kelly, how do you handle the fact that the observed data creates a biased training situation where it's only trained on data where West Nile virus is known to have occurred, to have occurred, but not where it's known to not occur? Um, so you don't know uh, where it's not happening. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. And you know, we're well, in one part we're making an assumption that West Nile virus is you know, more or less everywhere that it is going to be at this point, which is probably not a great assumption to be making, but one I think that we have to do in order to run the statistical analyses that, that we are running. Um, but I will say that you know, at least for the work that I'm actively working on, you know, we're looking at differences within these larger regions. And so you know, within these larger regions, um, we're able to kind of bypass this question of you know, places that aren't seeing data or aren't seeing cases in general. Um, and we do tend to focus on areas that are of higher impact when we're trying to understand the relationships between climate and, and West Nile virus. But it's uh, certainly a, a, good, a good question and something that we'll have to think more about. Excellent. I don't think we have any more questions right now, but if, <laughs> um, Ryan, if you would not mind sharing your last screen where you have your contact information while I'm talking, then maybe if anybody has any questions, oh, wait, we did get one more. Oh, some Tom said thanks for a nice presentation. Um, 
just so that folks can contact you if they do have more. Um, I would like to thank everyone for coming to the UCAR CPAS Discovery Seminar and remind you to go to our website to find out about future talks, and that's cpaess.ucar.edu. Um, and here you will also find a link to this talk after it's uploaded onto YouTube. As you can see on the screen, you have uh, one of Ryan's emails. You can contact him with further questions. Ryan, our sincere thanks to you for sharing this important work with us. Um, this work is becoming increasingly critical as our climate continues to change and present new health challenges for society. Excuse me. Um, thank you also to Jesse Webb of UCAR Multimedia Services for his invaluable assistance. And I hope that we get to see you all uh, for our next CPAS Discovery Seminar on Wednesday, May 15th. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone.